Bain Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Clovis Points, Bows and Arrows, and Paleolithic Marmot Attacks, Space Tethers and Avoiding Nazis, I hate those guys, and Fleeing to the Marisi Side of the Line. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have a talk with David Drake about an interesting project, The Hunter Returns, by David Drake and Jim Kelgard. Dave talks about how he and Jim Bain both loved Jim Kelgard books when they were kids, and how this collaboration over the seas of time and the boundary of life and death came about. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. First, here's the news. There's new fiction and non-fiction up this month at the Bain.com website. This time we have The Teacher, a really excellent short story that is co-written by Robert Conroy and J.R. Dunn. Bob Conroy died last December, leaving the teacher partially finished. This was meant to be a story set in the world of upcoming alternate history Germanica by Robert Conroy, which is a September hardcover. We asked science fiction novelist and the longtime copy editor on Robert Conroy's books, J.R. Dunn, to complete the story, and I think he did a marvelous job. Also up is a neat science article by space scientist and Bain novelist Les Johnson on the latest info on the use, and sometimes abuse, of space tethers and space elevators. It's good stuff from a guy who has directed actual NASA near-Earth projects, and it may give us a pretty accurate vision into the future. They are both available at Bain.com and at the Free Short Story 2015 and Free Nonfiction 2015 ebook anthologies, which are available at BainEbooks.com. I want to welcome David Drake to the podcast. Hello, David. Hi, Tony. Hi, Bain. David Drake is the archetype of the archetypical Bain writer. That is an archetype of an archetype. That's what I'm trying to say. Along with Jim Bain, he defined much of the tenor of what we do here at Bain Books. Dave is the creator of numerous novels and series, including the best-selling Hammer Slammers military science fiction series, and more recently, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy series. He's also the co-author uh, on a host of series, ranging from the Belisarius novels with Eric Flint to the Citizen series with John Lambshead, and the General series with um, S.M. Sterling, Eric Flint, and me, Tony Daniel. The latest there would be The Heretic and the Savior by me and Dave. Dave is also the author of two high fantasy series, including the Lord of the Isles series and more recently the Book of the Elements series with latest entry Monsters of the Earth. He's also a prolific short story writer and much of his early work is collected in uh, recent Bane offering Night and Demons, which we talked to Dave about on the podcast. 
and his time travel related stories in the collection Dinosaurs and a Dirigible. Davis is a graduate of Duke Law School. He's a Vietnam vet where he served in the 11th Cavalry Black Horse Regiment. He also reads Latin for Pleasure. Now out from Bain Books at Booksellers Everywhere is a very interesting young adult offering by David Drake and Jim Kajelgard. It's called The Hunter Returns. Dave, as I mentioned above, you are not just a Bain author, but you also were a close friend with Jim Bain. And that friendship, uh, I understand, had a lot to do with The Hunter Returns coming into being, doesn't it? Oh, it, it had everything to do with it. Uh, Jim had two formative books. When he was 14, he read two books that just made him. And one of them was Fire Hunter by Jim Kelgard. And I honestly don't know whether you pronounce a J or not, but I, I don't think you do. Uh, you know, if, if some Norwegian will get back to me on that, I will appreciate it. Uh, the, the other was Against the Fall of Night by, um, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, <laughs> the, the theme of both of them is that a young man, uh, fights accepted wisdom and uh, is is you know cast out of his group for doing so and winds up saving humanity uh by by going ahead and doing his own quirky things and Eleanor Wood who is friend of Jim's and a crackerjack agent learned that this was the case, and she handled Kelgard's estate. And so she offered Fire Hunter to Jim to republish. And he thought that was a wonderful idea. But it was only 40,000 words, which is what a Y8 in 1951 was supposed to be. I mean, that, that was fine, but it was not acceptable, really, for um, a, a mass market paperback. Yeah, and that would be a very thin book. A, a very thin book. But, I mean, you you were public. Um, ace doubles and even some ace singles at the time uh, were uh, coming out at that length. And so it, it was uh, perfectly acceptable in the SF field in the early 50s. Uh, and it was normal for a juvenile. But... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it wouldn't do it nowadays, so Jim figured it needed to be 65,000 words. And so he phoned me, saying quite correctly that I had been a big Jim Kelgard fan also. And look, he wrote all sorts of juveniles. Um, yeah, a lot of dog books. I certainly read all the dog books uh, that the library had, but... He did this. He did uh, a landmark book on the story of the Mormons. Uh, he was a working writer uh, who tended to specialize in outdoor and animal, human animal, human and animal books. Um, a, a friend of mine was a big fan of one of his called Nature Photographer about a kid who uh, goes out to become a, to earn his living as a nature photographer. And, uh, you know, this, this is, this was just one of a lot of things that Kelgard did. I didn't happen to have read this one when I was a kid, but um, I said, sure, uh, because I knew with Kelgard it was going to be a good story. And, um, and because Jim wanted me to. And, you know, that's the thing with friends. Uh, this was an important thing to Jim. And, yeah, hell, of course I'd do a friend a favor. He'd do me a favor. I, you know, that's <laughs> that's what it's about. Yeah, well, it was. Um, it, it seems like it was a labor of love for him. Oh, yeah, utterly. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I think... They, I think Bain must actually have made some money on it. Uh, at any rate, Tony is <laughs> reprinting it. Uh, but uh, that isn't why he was doing it. And that certainly isn't why I was doing it. Uh, look, I, I 
I'm glad to be paid. I I certainly am a professional writer, and Jim certainly was a professional publisher. But if you're in a job simply for the money, you're doing the wrong job. Uh, I mean, you, you've got to actually care about what you're doing other than a paycheck. Because, um, you, you know, you're going to get old, and uh, <laughs> I've gotten old. And if you've been just chipping away at a rock because chipping away at a rock pays, um, you're going to have a bunch of gravel to, to look back on. And I spent my life doing that. And the money, it's going to be all gone, trust me. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so do something you love at least. Uh, make some money and do something you love if you don't think it's going to make money off to, to the side, but do it. Is that the... Yeah, that that's uh, so. So we we did this because we wanted to to do it. And Jim told me, and he was this, this is funny. I I mentioned this in the little essay that I did for the, the website and all. But uh, Jim said, "Well, you know, we've got the hero Hawk, who's exiled from his tribe for thinking." Or you know, doing innovative things. Uh, he builds a spear thrower, and the first time he tries the spear thrower, he wounds a woolly rhino, uh, which is a bit of a problem, which we may get to later. But uh, and the the rhino turns and gores one of his um, tribesmen, and he is exiled from his tribe because he did not do things the accepted way and run up to the rhino and stab it. Um, and um, so he goes off and has to make his own life, which he does with a girl who is exiled from another tribe, and um, you know, they go from strength to strength. She's been hurt, and he's at, begin at the beginning he's taking care of her as well. And it, uh, you know, so it's, it, it is a typical YA of hero faces adversity and overcomes it. One of the things that I noticed that was, that I didn't expect when I first started on it was that Kelgard, um really evoked that kind of magical thinking, you know, that he got inside the the cavemen's heads and it and the the exile of hawk seemed almost reasonable when you looked at it from their point of view well that's it yeah the, these are not bad people uh they're not even actually stupid people uh what they are is non-creative people and when a, a creative person does something that is creative and different and it doesn't work, then obviously he's offended the gods, and you've got to get rid of him. <laughs> oh, he's, he's dangerous. Uh, and, and this was pretty obvious to me, by the way, thinking about it, but Jim's career in publishing uh, was very much like that of Hawk. Uh, he kept doing the non-standard thing and uh, having people angry with him. And, uh, you know, one of the the obvious cases where Jim insisted on doing it his way was uh, electronic publishing. And other people were talking about how to... Uh, how to encrypt stuff, how to prevent people from stealing stuff, all this sort of thing. And Jim just put it out in as many forms as he could get, uh, saying and, and meaning uh, that most people are honest. And they'd rather pay honestly than steal something. But if you put all sorts of layers of encryption and coding on it, 
uh, it makes it hard for them to use your book. And therefore, they'll do something else. Yeah, and that decision worked out pretty well for me and I, <laughs> considering our bottom line. Like, um, yeah, it, but people don't realize nowadays uh, this is the accepted wisdom that, uh, you know, you don't encrypt stuff. You give people a chance to buy it. But uh, at the time, this really was heresy. and. The, uh, the whole pain-free library idea of, you know, putting books up so that people could read them for free. Uh, you know, put up the first book of a series. And if somebody likes it, uh, then they'll buy the rest of the series. If they don't like it, they won't be pissed off at you because it hasn't cost them anything to learn that, no, I... I'm sorry, uh, I, I thought this was a different sort of book, and I don't like the sort of book it really is. You know, okay, nobody's angry in that case. Uh, and there, there were people who were publishers uh, furious with main books because he was doing this terrible thing. And uh, you know, I heard people venting about it. <laughs> Actually, no, it was really good marketing, although, frankly, I think Jim was doing it partly to be contrary. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he there there was a degree of contrariness for the sake of contrariness with him. Yeah. Well, that's probably a mix that you always find with the people that are geniuses or, or ahead of their time, I guess. They take pleasure in it sometimes. Well, maybe not everyone, but yeah, I, I I was not much of a drag on Jim when he said something outrageous. I, I will admit that you know my my reaction if Jim would say something outrageous would be to figure out how to make it more effective or to top him. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that is why we were friends. We were perhaps not always good for one another, but at least there was a kindred spirit in the room when we were talking. Yeah. Well, back to Fire Hunter. It came out in 1951, um, and like you said, you know, Kelgard wrote bunches of, of books. Um, did a lot of these dog books, dog and boy books. Mm -hmm. um, I you were a re I assume you were a reader when you were a kid in the 50s. Oh, hell yes, 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 yes. Um, what? Did the juveniles, I haven't read a huge amount of, of 50s juveniles, um, did the juveniles at the time have a certain feel to them? Oh. Perhaps different or characteristic? Yeah, uh, to a degree I think they did. Um, and I wasn't reading particularly science fiction juveniles, so there there were a lot of them. Uh, there was the Heinlein, uh, you know, juveniles. Uh, and I read a fair number of them. But Winston had a whole line of um, juveniles. Uh, and, and these were by real writers. Uh, people like uh, Alan E. Norris and Ed McBain, uh, Robert Silverberg. Uh, and I, our library did not have a subscription to that, to, to those. So I read them only sort of in a scattered fashion. But I read all, read all the dog books. Uh, then I read all the horse books, which were mostly for girls. Uh, I read the plain adventure books like those, um, Oh, the, the Todd Moran um, mysteries, because they were mysteries, were set on tramp steamers in the Pacific, where, um, oh gosh, blocking on his name, fairly major name. Um, there were there were car books by people like Henry Greger, Greger Feldson. Um, and they were all about story. And I, I don't mean 
that the author didn't believe something, uh, because very frequently the author did believe something, and it comes through pretty strongly, but it was about story. It, it definitely was not primarily there to um, oh, conduce better citizenship or more tolerant citizenship or, you know. Yeah, or literary uh, falutinous. Well, you got to yeah. get it. You got to drag a kid in. That's a that's the hardest audience, perhaps of of all. Well, yeah, that's that's the thing. And uh, one of the odd things I ran into when I was a kid was um, I read a uh, a fix up novel. It was actually four uh, novellas uh, published as a novel. Hawk Cars about Hawk Cars, a space hawk. And these were really dreadful um, hack fiction written by the editors of Astounding Stories in the 30s, um, the early 30s, that is, before it was taken over by Street and Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they wrote these series as adventure fiction because... At the time, SF didn't have a lot of adventure fiction in it, and also because it, the magazine paid top rates, and they were the editors were <laughs> lining their own pockets considerably by buying from themselves. Hmm. I would never do that here at Bain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would never be an editor, but... <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, it really was a secret, is they were paying themselves, but they were writing under a pseudonym, mm -hmm. under a series of pseudonyms. This was definitely pre-Campbell, then. Oh, hell yes. This was before Tremaine. Mm -hmm. No, no. Uh, Campbell was writing also, but he was writing for uh, Amazing, actually. Uh, but, um, no, th this was... Um, Christ, I'm blocking on all these names. Biz Hall and senior editor who wrote Farewell to the Master. I will have to look it up, Dave. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. Uh, but, but anyway, no, these these were the Clayton astoundings. This was 19... This is where we need Hank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. Uh, and, and it's just Extremely embarrassing, I can't think of his name. Harry Bates, Harry Bates, was a senior editor. And he and Des Hall wrote the uh, Hawk Curse stories. And they were bound together in uh, about 1950, published as a book. And I now know, because I've read them now, uh, the Digest magazines at the time were devastating in their reviews of, you know, the, the worst kind of hack work, uh, which in a manner of speaking is true, but I read them as a kid and I thought, these are really good stories because they're all full of action. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it was cliched, but it isn't cliched when you're 13. And it was over the top of, you know, it, it was the Western in space stories. Yeah. Uh, that the Galaxy in, in 1950 was parodying on their back covers. But this works if you're 13. And they, what was adult fiction in 1930 was extremely good entry-level juvenile science fiction in 19... Well, at the time I was reading them, 1958. Uh, but they're, you know, they're published in 1950 or thereabouts, republished. We are publishing Hunter Returns as a YA um, trade paperback. And it's in the in our special, you know, teen fiction size uh, that, that all the all the publishers use these days. Uh, you know, we have YAs, we have middle grade, we have uh, 
I, this new new area they're calling new adult, which I mean I guess means early twenties. Um, <laughs> well, I guess you know kids who've come through school recently and can't really read. Yeah, <laughs> that, that that's bad of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> What do you think we lost from that era? And I mean, I think we know what we gained, perhaps, um, you know, but pseudo sophistication, something like that. Well, look, I grew up in the era and I love the books I was reading then. And some of them are pretty darn good books now. But let me say this also. Um, I'm not concerned that the books weren't dealing with the real problems of a 14-year-old junkie. I mean, actually, some of them were <laughs> dealing with pretty hard things. But but that isn't the problem. Uh, and they were not inclusive. They were not... Um, I mean, you, you, you had kids going out and shooting jaguars. Yeah. Well, Hawk is not depressed. If he got depressed and started acting like a moody teenager, he would be dead pretty quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he, he would be food uh, for, for something else. But, but the thing is, you know, I, there are a lot of things that are not politically correct but are not bad. On the other hand, there were aspects of what was accepted then that take me aback when I look back at it. So, yeah. Well, let's talk about the Fire Hunter a little more. Um, yeah. It's tailor made for the, the situation. I, this is a old science fiction sort of gag that that it has um, that's been used in various ways. Um, you had a harder task though. You got to handle. Yeah, you know, it's got a smart, great her hero who who figures stuff out. You had to handle the dumbasses, right? Yeah, I um, know. <laughs> this was Jim's brilliant. Um, idea. He's, before I'd read the book, remember, this is not one I'd read, but while he was talking to me and we were sort of planning uh, that, yeah, I'll do that, uh, he said, you know, I think the best way to handle bulking it up, because I, I had to read about 25,000 words, uh, the best way to do that would be for you to follow the tribe. So you have Hawk going from one success to another. And, um, you know, you, you just go back and cover the tribe after Pox left them. Okay, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> but when I got the book and read it, I saw what that meant. What that meant, basically, was that I had to kill three quarters of the characters in the, the first couple of chapters and I had 25,000 words to kill all these people <laughs> <laughs> because in the the conclusion this is going to be a spoiler people if, if this surprises me or if, this, if this surprises you what I'm going to say then you're probably not up to reading the book anyway but uh, the, the the tribe, the, the wretched remnants of the tribe come and beg Hawk to take them in, and he magnanimously does so. So, it, and he gives the numbers of them there at the end. So, my job was to go from where they started, which I think was about 30, 32 down to seven people. Yeah, you had to make the math work. Yeah, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> but that made for some really interesting chapters. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a march of horribles that you put the poor tribe through. Um, some of these, it's, but you said before, some of the best were taken by Kelgard himself, and you had to come up with some pretty good ones, but you had to do a little more... Uh, I don't know. Uh, my favorite was the giant beaver, by the way. Uh, the, the giant beaver of death. Yes. Yeah. Working Beavers? title of that chapter was uh. the giant beaver of death. <laughs> uh, 
Beavers are scary creatures when you really come upon them. They will fight you. But um... Well, yes, and, and this was eight feet long. I mean, I, I didn't... Everything I put in there is real. You know, it, they, they were real critters. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Hawk has been meeting all these typical, terrible prehistoric monsters and overcoming them. And so I figured I had to use different monsters. I mean, I, I couldn't have my people using a saber-toothed tiger. Uh, we'd already had one in the book, and, you know, that's just bad art. If Kelgard and I had been working together on it, um, I think we we could have divided <laughs> the available animals better. But... Uh, the uh, the result was I was sort of left with the dregs. Uh, but, you know, I did what I could. <laughs> the dregs of the Pleistocene. Well, it's the, what is about maybe uh, 10,000, yeah, 20,000 years ago? Yeah. Um, the, the real problem with it, I mean, it is quite clearly set in the American Southwest which is where Kelgard lived and, for, you know, the area he knew, and he knew very well. Um, but he, in the, the opening there, as they say, there's a woolly rhino. And unlike the mammoths, the woolly rhinoceroses never left Eurasia. So... Theoretically, if it were taking place in a place that had woolly rhinos, it would not be in North America. But a lot of the other critters, like Smilodonts, uh, the saber tooths, mm -hmm. were properly um, North American. And so I had to make a decision. I thought, hell, I know the Pleistocene of North America better than I know the European Pleistocene. So, uh, so I used North America also. Yeah. But well, uh, that that limited my... I, I couldn't use um, hyenas, for example, because the only hyenas in uh, North America at the time were uh, fast-running critters. Uh, qu quite interesting and all, but they're, they're basically the equivalent of cheetahs. You know, they're very long-legged, fast-running uh, creatures, and they were not sufficiently horrible for uh, my purposes. So uh, I, there was, however, uh, dogs specialized for bone crushing, and um, I, uh, I used them fairly effectively. Are the... We also have dire wolves. Um, is that what you're talking about? The, or is that a different? No, no. The, the dire wolf is a very similar to the the gray wolf. Uh, the it wasn't even much bigger, but the bones were significantly heavier. So, and yeah, I could use them, but but remember, I I can only have one. Well, I decided. I would only have one horrible creature per chapter. I had to switch horrible creatures, which is why the last two are the giant beaver of death and the marmot of doom. Well, by the time we get there, it they are scary. The scenario, I mean, these people are at their wits' end. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, as, as I said in that little essay, uh, I sent my 25,000 words in, and Jim started reading it, having forgotten he told me it was to be interfiled. <laughs> he called my wife to see if I was suicidal because it was such a grim. I mean, you know, he, he was used to grim and all, and, and he didn't insist on stuff being all sweetness and light, but Jesus, had she read this? <laughs> Well, you just did it in your job. Uh, oh, yeah. he was embarrassed when 
when she mentioned that, well, I, I think he intended them to be interfiled with the existing chapters. And, oh, yes! <laughs> it, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. So he read it straight through what you sent him without yeah, the, the Kelgard portion. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be pretty grim. <laughs> <laughs> so he's reading this 25,000 words of people being eaten and trampled and stabbed and bitten in half by giant beaver teeth. Yeah. Well, I think the, the way that you interspersed it, or, or him, uh, it really is effective because it, at just the right moment we go back to Hawk or it, or go away from Hawk and... and mm -hmm. It, I mean, it, it does give a different feel to the book. I mean, you see a kid succeeding under, you know, difficult circumstances, and that's good. But you don't really appreciate how difficult circumstances are until you get a scene that shows what the alternative is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, if... If the tribe had continued going its own way, following tradition, um, it was going to be in very bad condition, um, and indeed is there at the end. Yeah. The The problem is that they've developed all these traditions um, during times of plenty, and now conditions have changed, and they're not adapting well, right? Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, why change a winning combination? And the answer is, well, it stopped winning. Well, your your main character, your main character is Wolf, who's the leader of the tribe. Although the tribe is really the main character in your your portion. It, um, it really is. But yes, he he is the chief, and he's not really dumb. He's not like a some kind of stereotypical caveman or anything. He's he's. Oh. Quite I mean, an intelligent fellow, and he's a great hunter. And, and he's dealing with the world he knows. And the problem is that the world has changed a bit from when he knew it. And, you know, that's not... Look, um, Kodak used to be one of the biggest corporations in America. It wasn't that long ago. Xerox was huge not that long ago. I mean, this happens. Uh, you know, you get complacent or you get unlucky or conditions change and somebody eats your lunch. Uh, literally in the case of the tribe here. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that is an important point that the book, I think, makes because you, you do create these, uh, you know, well well-rounded characters is that People back then were just as smart as us, um, and perhaps smarter. Um, they just didn't have as much information to act on, perhaps. Yeah, and they had different information. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is important. When you, when you read about someone who is ignorant, it is very easy, if you don't have a lot of experience yourself, to think that ignorant means stupid. Ignorant does not mean stupid. It means they don't know. Now, if somebody remains ignorant in the face of changing conditions and doesn't attempt to change, you know, you're going to get it wrong. You're, you will make mistakes. Hawk doesn't make mistakes, except for maybe the, the atlatl, <laughs> the spear thrower early on. Uh, he doesn't make mistakes, but, you know, the fact is, if you start doing a bunch of new things, you're going to fall on your face. And that was certainly the case with Jim Bain and Fane Books. It's certainly been the case with me and some of the books I've written. And it seemed like a really good idea, but in fact, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So that when the returns come in. <laughs> yeah. Um, Being able to see that is also a special when to double down and when to cut your losses. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've done both. Jim's done both. Well, Jim did both. Um, well, on the Kelgard side of the of the plot, um, we have Hawk, 
and uh, the dog, he gets a dog, and the dog was really one of my favorite characters, and it really felt like Kelgard like, breathed a sigh of relief and started writing naturally, like, you know, this is where I want to tell this dog story. Um, yes. Because he, he clearly just loves dogs. <laughs> he comes across, he you know, loving uh, descriptions and such. Knew them, uh, observed them, understood them. Yeah, uh, his his strength was writing dog books, but dog books in his case meant almost always dog and boy books. Uh, I, I mentioned nature photographer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kid who's going out to be a photographer has a dog, and you know they they go out into the woods, the uh, quite deep woods in the Rockies uh, together. And yeah, that was very much part of his worldview. Yeah. And he describes hunting with dogs in a way that lets you know, because I've seen this done very poorly before people that have no idea how dogs actually aid a hunter. You know, he, he knew what he was talking about. He gets the, the details right on that. Uh, he, he was very much that I, he was a, fine writer, and a very observant man. What do you think um, adults will find to like in this little novel? It's a darn good story. Uh, It'll tell you something about Holocene existence. And... uh, I think the fact that it's look, this is basically upbeat. I mean, despite <laughs> despite my twenty five thousand words, this is a basically upbeat book about people striving against difficulty and succeeding. And even in my part, the tribe having the tribe takes a lot of convincing. But eventually, they come around to the notion that, you know, the kid was right all the time. Let's see if we can find him. And they do. Yeah. And after following them, you feel a great sense of relief for them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The the wretched remnants. (laughs) Oh, I I did some really grisly scenes in that. (laughs) I really did. Um, what was your favorite? Uh... Oh, <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you this, but the Marmot of Doom. I mean, I really got down <laughs> to a very low level of, all right, what kind of critter do we have for this chapter? Because I still need to get rid of one of the women. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so I, I have the marmot sequence. Uh, it's worth mentioning that a lot of the problems in the stuff I wrote is, although an animal may be the precipitating factor, animal or animals, um, it's really human beings fighting amongst themselves in desperation. Because that is the big thing about the tribe is desperate. They are taking serious risks because they've got to do something, and they're having bad luck also. Uh, But the marmot, the title of the chapter is simply Marmot, but my... My working title was The Marmot of Doom, (laughs) and that's a pretty grisly scene, (laughs) but it sort of distills what it means to be so desperate you're insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that you really feel there is a a character that, that goes insane, and having to deal with that in the, uh, in, in that sort of environment. It's, it's really pathetic. It makes you feel for her. Um, there's pathos, let's put it that way. Well, that was my intention. Because yeah. 
I don't normally kill that. I've, I know I've got a reputation, but I don't normally kill that many people in my books, and I certainly don't kill three quarters of them in in most of my books. Well, what are you working on at the moment, by the way? Since oh, well, I'm in the climax, and by that I mean spaceships are shooting at one another. I am breaking, however, to to do a, uh, an interview. Uh, I am working on an RCN novel. Um, the uh, <laughs> Death's Right Day, and I am in the climax. I've got about a hundred thousand words, and uh, stuff is happening. But we're going off to to England um, on Monday, tenth through the eighteenth. So there will be a delay in finishing it. But um, I am working busily on the next RCN novel, and I'm pretty close to being, as I say, I'm finishing the climax. But there is a a significant, fairly lengthy conclusion to go after it. So. Excellent. Well, I believe we've got that on the summer schedule <laughs> of next year. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, but I if, I my, seem to remember doing that. So, if the plane crashes in mid-Atlantic, yeah. uh, I think you can print. Yeah, it takes some typing up, but I've got a very full. Uh, a very full outline for the conclusion. So, well, just be careful. So, if it happens to me, it'll be okay. <laughs> okay, so we don't have to pull a pull a kale guard on you or the other way around. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> Kelgard actually shot himself. <laughs> yes, that's well. Yeah, that's uh, true. He um, died in about 1959, I believe. No. Mm. But he had a lot of, I think it was a suicide after a great deal of, of physical pain from something. Yeah. So. Uh, but let me tell you, it's a job you can get depressed at. I, however, am no longer depressed. I'm just, you know, a, a, <laughs> a bright little rosebud. Yeah. Do you, I, this is kind of a silly psychological question, but do you think that any of this, uh, uh, this writing of this portion, your portion of this particular little, little YA book helped expiate or, or bring something in your own life, your own, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I was doing a number of really bleak at the time. And I. What else were you writing at the time you wrote this? What period of Drake was this? Oh, well, I was doing the Reaches series. And those are pretty grim. Uh, it, Bain's got it out as the Reaches trilogy. Mm -hmm. And I, I had just done the Northworld trilogy. And those, again, are pretty hard books. Uh, I, I think they're very well done. But these are not easy books. They're about people in hard circumstances who become just as hard as what they're facing. And at the end, uh, come very close to becoming what they're facing. And um, then in the mid-90s, I wrote Redliners. And um, I was able to turn that around. And it really did make... It was very important to me to put paid to the anger. Mm. Uh, I don't mean I don't still have the anger at at Vietnam. At this arose from, I mean, this is not a big secret. You've spoken about it often. Um, Vietnam had a huge effect on you and, and not a very good one. <laughs> no, a really bad one. <laughs> a really bad one, Tony. Uh, and no, this isn't any secret. Um, 
I I felt really betrayed by my government for sending me there and my country for the way they treated us when we got back. And I was right in both those beliefs, but it was not useful just to be angry. So how was Redliners a turning point? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, it was putting troops in a hard situation in the presence of civilians hmm. who got an inkling of what it had been like. And uh, one of the, the military characters in the book, uh, it, this special forces lieutenant who made a, a trip to see me to get his copy signed, said that the, the line that really made the book for him was where one of the soldiers says, well, this is the first time we've been protecting them, and meaning the civilians. Mm -hmm. And the administrator who's responsible for all this says, no, you've been protecting them all, all along. This is the first time they've seen it. And that was kind of the point. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion after I wrote it that if the people back in the world did not understand what it was like, then that meant we'd done our job because our job was to keep perfectly ordinary people from knowing what it was like. And, you know, okay, I can't, I can't complain that we did our job too well. And, you know, some of them behaved badly and, and some certainly did. Um, well, some people do. I mean, you know, that's just what it is. Nothing to be angry about. Um, some people do. And I've been behaving extremely badly for my tour. The, <laughs> the point of, I mean, one of the themes of Redliners is also that um, you turn somebody into a certain sort of person, you they can't just turn it off. No, <laughs> you really can't. <laughs> you really can't. Uh, I haven't learned that trick yet. As I say, I've uh, I've got the anger pretty well controlled for the past twenty years. Uh, but I'll never be a civilian again. Mm. Well, uh, I don't want to end on that grim note. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What what else do we have to say about the Hunter Returns? Um, I you know I think it's a really hopeful story in the end. It's it's about people being um, being clever, surviving. It, it's about people thinking outside the box, even when it costs them, and uh, and winning and saving the people who were arguing the loudest against what they were doing. Because that's, that's what Hawk does. Uh, it's not just that he survives, but he actually saves his fellows uh, despite themselves. And that's really what Jim Bain saw himself as doing with a lot of the things that Bain books did. You know, focus on story, the focus on accessible e-books, um, all of this, he was doing his best to save science fiction publishing. And, you know, uh, Bain Books is doing really well now. And uh, as I know from my royalty reports, and that's, that's not a bad thing. Uh, no, it, it's a darn good 
thing, even though it, it makes some people very angry. <laughs> well, I think it's a great thing. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> but the, uh, the, I mean, I don't want to go on and on, but the, we do have the Baney Books retail site is really, it's the world's largest genre um, ebook retail site. You know, next to, you know, Amazon's everything. Uh, but we do mostly genre, and we have many other things besides Bain Books. We have a lot of third party, uh, third other publishers that, that sell through it. And, you know, Jim sort of created the seeds for all that and then made it happen. Uh, he absolutely did. I mean, there are people like John Kessel who are, you know, Bain authors now. John hated Bain Books. <laughs> I made John a Bain author just to get give him a little rib. <laughs> but you know that's that's I think the only place he's in public is being published now. But he, uh, you know, he hated Bain books. He would not buy a book that was a Bain book. Uh, but you know, just like Hawk, uh, Jim's site is saving a lot of people who should be published, despite themselves. Well, that's it. Yeah. 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 Good thing. Yeah. That's, uh, people can't necessarily be blamed for being idiots. I mean, <laughs> so. People cannot be blamed for having principles. Political idiots. But, uh, uh, well, people cannot be blamed for having principles. Some yeah. of the principles are counter survival. And that is certainly what, what, you know, Wolf and his tribe learned. But they were not randomly, they were not stupid, they were not random. They were strong believers in principle. And, you know, uh, that's true of really a lot of people now. Um, not me. I mean, I don't believe in anything. Uh, that, <laughs> that was one of the things I gained from Nam. Uh, you know, complete uh, disbelief in anybody's ideology. But there are a lot of very decent people who do believe things. And uh, Bain Books makes it possible for them to believe what they believe and to sell to everyone who wants that particular flavor. Uh, I, I think that is one of Jim's greatest legacies, that... You know, he is keeping alive, even after his death, a lot of stuff that he flat didn't agree with. But, you know, he did believe in the free market, and he did believe in access. And, you know, bless his memory. Yeah. Well, the book that we're talking about at the moment is the hunter returns by David Drake and Jim Kelgard. And it is now available at booksellers everywhere. Look in the teen section. If you want to find it in, uh, in your, in your bookstore, Dave, thank you once again for being with us. A pleasure as always, Tony. Um, you know, I'm always willing to talk. <laughs> I will now go back to finishing a, a, a great space battle. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Tom waved the woman between them and took up a position covering Durante. Kaplan was driving and prepared to move out as soon as the zombie was tagged and bagged. Deep breath, mate, 
Tom said, sotto voce. Don't make me laugh, Durante replied, then took the shot. The zombie seemed to throw off the effect of the taser at first, nearly reaching Durante, then dropped to the ground, shuddering. Keep up the juice, Tom said, stepping forward. He holstered his Glock and pulled out an ampule. The auto-injector drove 15 cc's of Dilaudid into the zombie's thigh. Then he stepped back. Let up on the juice, he said. The zombie, a man in his early 40s and previously in good condition from the looks of him, stumbled to his feet and started to lunge for the team leader, then stumbled to its knees. In a moment, it was back on its face as the narcotic took hold. Tig and bag, Tom said, pulling out a pair of flex cuffs. Ma'am, do you know this gentleman? Can you identify him? Never seen him before in my life, Corinda said, still gasping for air. He just came around the corner as I was going into the deli. I've been running ever since. I mean, he turned the corner off Houston to chase me. Why? No idea, ma'am, Tom said. He and Durante had already flex cuffed the zombie and bagged his head in case he came to. As Durante started the blood test, Tom pulled out a receipt and filled it out with bogus information. If you know of anyone looking for him, please refer them to NYPD. They'll be able to determine his disposition. He pulled out the receipt off the pad and handed it to her. Okay, Corinda said, looking at the paper. Is he... is he going to the warehouse? I'm afraid so, ma'am, Tom said. He looked at Durante, who nodded. He's positive for neurological packet H7D3. I guess I survived my first zombie attack, Corinda said, trying to smile. That's something. Yes, ma'am, Tom said, taking one of the zombie's arms. Have a nice day. It had only taken an hour to collect five zombies, three male, two female, and they'd seen more incidents on the way back to the warehouse. I can't get that people are still just going to work, Durante said, hooking one of the female flex-cuffed ankles into a hoist hook. I mean, they're walking right past other folks being attacked, and it's like, whatever, gotta get to lunch. It's New York, Kaplan said, bringing over the butcher knife. What do you expect? I mean, how do you tell the difference between a zombie apocalypse and every day? He drove the knife into the woman's throat, then cut out and away. There was a spray of cardioid blood that fell on the pre-spread painting tarp in a broad splatter of red. Hey, look, Durante said. We're making modern art. We could probably sell this in a gallery for big bucks. Can it, Tom said. He understood. At a certain level, they all really hated what they were doing. They hated that it was necessary. And they hated even more that they were enjoying it. They hated themselves. And so they joked. But if he let it go too far, they might forget that they were, in fact, humans and under discipline. Cut all the way up and back to the highest cervical vertebrae. Roger, Kaplan said, slicing further into the neck as Durante stabilized the woman's body. The ceramic knife slid up through the muscles, tendons, and arteries of the neck like butter. The cut around the spine was somewhat ragged but serviceable. Okay. Tom said, coming over. This is the tricky bit. Gravy, hold the body firmly. Cap, get the clippers and bag ready. Tom applied a sharp twist and snapped the connections at the disc, then slowly and smoothly slid the spinal cord out of the spine. Don't let it hit the floor, Tom said, juggling the head in one hand and catching the falling spine with the other. Why well, want to reduce contamination. Roger, Kaplan said, holding the lower portion of the white cord. This I've never done. I mean, slaughtering pigs, yes, I've done that, and goats, but I've never stripped a spinal cord. I don't think many people have, Tom said, holding up the head by the woman's hair. He tried to ignore that it was a fine, light brown. The woman was probably in her forties, but she'd taken care of herself, until she became a zombie, of course. Got it? Got it, Kaplan said, working the cord into a Ziploc bag. He gathered the rope-like material into the bag, then snipped it at the base of the woman's spine with a pair of bandage scissors. 
The last of the spinal cord dropped into the bag. That it? That's it, Tom said, setting the head down on the floor and taking the bag. See that red? Blood? Durante said, leaning forward to look. Spinal cord should be pure white or a slight yellow, Tom said. That red you see is virus bodies, big bundles of millions of individual viruses, which makes this one a winner. He carried the bag over to a cooler, opened it up, and dropped the bag on the ice. Four more to go. I assure you I decontaminated the outside before I brought it over, Tom said, setting the cooler down on the doctor's desk. Which is why you're wearing nitrile gloves, Curry said. So was he, and goggles, and a light respirator. He opened up the cooler and pulled out one of the bags. Should I ask? There are people in the city who have pet monkeys, Tom said, tonelessly. They get zombieitis too. It's not zombieitis, Dr. Curry said, examining the spinal cord. Itis refers to inflammation. Positive for H7D3, though. Zombigenic? Nobody has a really good term yet. This monkey would be about five foot seven, at a guess. And in good enough shape to chase a woman two blocks, Tom said. Fast monkey. Your point? None, really, Dr. Curry said. I'll be doing the work in the hot zone, and I suppose that twitting the person who brought it to me is one of the stupidest possible things I could do, all things considered. Doc, as long as you're producing vaccine, you've got nothing to worry about, Tom said. That had a faintly sinister tone to it, Mr. Smith, Dr. Curry said, starting to suit up. And if you think I'm not feeling rather sinister at the moment, Doc... You're an idiot, Tom said, yawning slightly. I'll keep that firmly in mind, Curry said. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com to Bain intern Matt Posick, Hans Daniel, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a gather of Jungian archetypes and platonic forms that alternate between arguing about whether a lap is an eternal verity or just something that happens when you sit down, and singing primordial hymns of thanks and gratitude to David Drake, co-author with Jim Kelgard of The Hunter Returns. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Stars.